Okay. Okay. Hi, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. This is our last um, NNE CTR seminar of the season. My name is Katie Modell. I'm a faculty scientist at Maine Health Institute for Research, and I'm interested in how the nervous system regulates bone turnover. Um, before we get started, just a few housekeeping things. Um, there will be a question and answer session at the end, but at any time, feel free to put a question into the chat and I'll moderate those um, questions at the end. You can also raise your hand and we can and feel free to unmute for discussion at the end as well. So our speaker today um, is Dr. Aurora Quay. She is an assistant professor in anesthesia at Tufts Medical School and a faculty scientist one at the Center for Interdisciplinary Population and Health Research, CIPER, within Maine Health Institute for Research. Dr. Quay completed residency at Mass General Hospital and a fellowship in regional anesthesia and acute pain medicine at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. She's an attending anesthesiologist for Spectrum Healthcare Partners and is a member of the Acute Pain and Regional Anesthesia Service at Maine Medical Center in Portland. Her interests include identifying perioperative opioid reduction strategies for patients at risk of or suffering from opioid use disorder. And Dr. Quay contributed to the development and publication of perioperative buprenorphine continuation guidelines for patients with a history of opioid use disorder. These guidelines have been successfully implemented at Massachusetts General Hospital, along with other institutions, and have shown early promise in facilitating postoperative pain relief. Dr. Quay's talk today is entitled Optimizing Perioperative Buprenorphine Management in Patients with Opioid Use Disorder. And I will turn it over to Dr. Quay now. Welcome. The floor is yours. Oh, great. Thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction. And Thank you for giving me a platform to talk about my work involved in trying to figure out the best way to manage patients that come in with acute pain um, conditions on buprenorphine. So I think it's first it's important to give some background about how opioid use disorder is affecting Maine specifically. So for over two decades, of course, we've been in this devastating epidemic that just keeps getting worse. And according to recent data from the National Survey on Drug Use Report, 8% of Maine residents over the age of 12 actually have substance use disorder. And of those, 3.6% actually have an opioid use disorder diagnosis. So there are significant regional variations in terms of the prevalence of opioid use disorder all across our state and counties such as Oxford County, Penobscot County, um, uh, Kennebec and Androscoggin County have the highest prevalence of opioid use disorder. But along those lines, there also are significant differences in terms of where outpatient treatment facilities are dispersed throughout our state. So to give you some background, uh, Maine actually only has 12 treatment facilities throughout our entire state. Uh, Massachusetts has almost 120. Um, and of those 12, um, four of them are in Bangor, you know, and then um, three of them are in Cumberland County. And so there are large swaths of the state where people aren't able to get treatment, specifically in the form of methadone, and have to travel over an hour each way in order to be able to get that life-saving treatment. So it can be very disruptive, especially for our state, more than other places, in part because of our rurality. Um, and there are significant um, costs that are being borne by society because of this epidemic right now as well. The Society of Actuaries um, released a statement stating that almost $180 billion is spent a year on the cost related to criminal justice costs, lost productivity, family assistance, and child costs um, related to this epidemic. So it's a, it's a huge problem, not just affecting us, but of course the whole nation. Um, and there are significant mortality implications for this as well, unfortunately. So over 2 million Americans have opioid use disorder. Um, and for Maine, we are mirroring national figures in terms of the amount of opioid deaths related to opioid misuse. However, um, the incidence of mortality in Maine is over two times higher than anywhere else in the country. Um, we are the eighth highest state in ranking in terms of the number of overdose deaths. So it's a really big problem here. Um, and again, it started in 1999, as we're all aware of, where we started giving pain medications to patients in order to treat that fifth vital sign. And a decade later, when we realized how harmful these medications were, we stopped prescribing them as much. People started going onto the street to look for formulation to deal with their dependence in the form of heroin. Um, and a couple years later, uh, in 2015, when fentanyl and fentanyl derivatives contaminated our supply, you're seeing the skyrocketing exponential increase in overdose deaths. 
that just keeps getting worse. 2018, there was a little bit of a drop here. That partly was because of greater restrictions for carfentanil um, that was coming from China, which was even more potent than fentanyl. However, because of the pandemic and issues with people not seeking medical attention, outpatient treatment facilities closing down, social isolation, the skyrocketing occurred again. Um, and there was a 23% increase in 2021, another 14% increase in 2022. 716 people died last year because of opioid overdose. So there is a lot of work that's ongoing in order to identify the reasons for this and why New England is especially so hard hit um, because of this crisis. And part of it is because of this known drug trafficking area called the New England High Intensity Drug Trafficking Area. So it encompasses 13 counties and there are extensive air, sea and land infrastructures that connect domestic and foreign drug markets. And as you can see, Cumberland County is one of those. And drugs basically come through these borders, go up to Canada. And unfortunately, residents that live in these areas are going to be vulnerable to the highly potent illicit drugs that go through the area. Um, so what makes this area different than other drug trafficking areas in the country is the fact that the um, illicit compounds that are coming through are a lot more potent than things that are coming from like west of the Mississippi, for instance. So uh, this is an important slide to kind of take into perspective um, about how dangerous these medications or these drugs can be. So heroin is only twice as potent as morphine. Fentanyl is 100 times more potent than morphine. Carfentanil, something that's contaminated drug supply for a really long time, is up to 10,000 times more potent than morphine. So just 20 micrograms, less than a grain of salt, is deadly. Um, and because the Northeast has powder formulations of um, heroin, it makes it easy to contaminate the drug supply with these very cheap, easy to, um, to move across border um, compounds. West of the Mississippi, it's more of a black tar substance that's coming from Mexico. And so it's a lot hard to contaminate. And that's one of the reasons why, even though there's a significant prevalence, people aren't dying as in the frequency at which they're dying here. Um, and so there is treatment, of course, um, FDA approved treatment to manage um, patients with opioid use disorder. And the three FDA approved formulations are methadone, buprenorphine, and then naltrexone, which is an antagonist medication. So for this talk, I'm gonna focus mainly on buprenorphine because there's a lot of controversy in terms of how to manage this medication specifically. Um, but it's important to recognize that all of these medications do help with reducing overdose deaths, reducing violent crime, improving treatment outcomes um, and, and saving lives. And so I think it's important to in order to really understand um, how these medications work, it's really important to know why they're so addictive. So I'm just going to do a brief refresher on the limbic system. So whenever we encounter anything that is pleasurable or enjoyable, it leads to the release of dopamine from the ventral tegmental area. And then from there, the reward pathway is activated. So when dopamine goes to the amygdala, the area that's involved in fear processing, it leads to release of anxiety. Uh, when it goes to nucleus accumbens, an area involved in pleasure, people feel joy and euphoria. And then when it goes to hippocampus, uh, these long lasting memories associated with all the good feelings that occurred during this instance are crystallized. And unfortunately, this is gonna be the driving force of that um, addiction relapse cycle. And so it is modulated by GABA neuronal regulation. So when these neurons fire, they inhibit the release of dopamine, okay? And then that is regulated by the prefrontal cortex, which is basically the decision maker of the entire brain that gets all the information, um, from throughout the brain or to be able to figure out whether to stop or continue, repeat whatever caused the surge of dopamine. And opioids basically modulate GABAergic regulation. Um, and this is a schematic from a cellular level of how it works. So um, GABA fires, it leads to hyperpolarization um, in the postsynaptic neuron leading to no dopamine release. But what opioids do is they inhibit the inhibition. So opioid binds to the G protein couple receptor it blocks adenylate cyclate activity, which basically decreases calcium permeability, hyperpolarization, and then you get dopamine release. So opioids that are misused can lead to surges up to 20 times normal. Um, so one of the most powerful brain experiences that you can experience. And unfortunately, with chronic exposure, you end up getting stronger connections in these GABAergic signaling, um, in these GABAergic inhibitory connections. Um, there are mouse models that have been done that have identified that uh, with mice that are exposed to um, chronic morphine, they end up getting um, high, large elevation cyclic AMP. Uh, there's also a down regulation of dopamine use. So basically what all that means is that over time, 
um, patients will need opioids just to feel normal because there's this hyperexcitability that occurs in this inhibition pathway. And so how do medications for opioid use disorder work? They basically stabilize the system. They bind to these receptors for an extended period of time. So you end up getting a more regulated, long-lasting release of dopamine, as opposed to the rapid peaks and troughs that occur with drugs of abuse that only bind to the receptor for middle, milliseconds as opposed to minutes. Um, and there's been a lot of work that has shown that these medications are effective clinically. So this is a um, prospective trial that was done at Yale, UPenn, UCLA that randomized um, patients to either get buprenorphine or methadone treatment or just behavioral support treatment. And they followed them for over five years. And what they found was that the, the people who were randomized to receive treatment use less opioids the, as opposed to the people who didn't get treatment at all. So we know that these meds work and they mark, work pretty well. So um, now we can talk about buprenorphine specifically. And buprenorphine, one of the reasons why it works so well as a opioid um, replacement therapy is because of the fact that it's highly lipophilic. So pharmacokinetically, it lasts in patients systemically for a very long period of time. Um, so in terms of that, it's similar to methadone. Um, it has a mean half-life that's over a day. Um, the things that make it different than methadone is the fact that you can get really good analgesia with very low receptor occupancy. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why it's used routinely as a chronic pain medication. And the doses that are used for chronic pain are a lot less than the doses that are actually used for opioid use disorder. Um, so it's 50 times more potent than morphine. Um, and it binds to the receptors quite strongly. Um, however, the thing that makes it unique as a opioid in general is that the only opioid that's a partial agonist after the immune receptor um, and then antagonizes kappa receptors. So that partial agonism means that you end up getting low intrinsic activity. Um, you get you don't get an inc a linear increase in effect with higher doses of buprenorphine as you get with full agonists. So at a at a particular point, you don't end up getting the same level of analgesia if you keep giving more and more of the buprenorphine. You also don't get the same level of respiratory depression if you keep giving more and more buprenorphine. And so that's one of the reasons why it can be dispensed as a 30-day supply for people suffering from open use disorder because it's a lot safer than methadone where people will have to go to a clinic because they can abuse it and then they can overdose on it if they're not given it, taking the medication as prescribed. The other important point about buprenorphine is that because of this really high binding affinity, if someone comes in with an acute pain condition and they need their pain to be treated, it's very hard for that adjuvant opioid that's given to displace the buprenorphine. Um, and so this is actually one of the main reasons why for a long time, buprenorphine was stopped when acute pain situations were anticipated. The last thing that's important to talk about with buprenorphine is that, that it does have abuse potential um, because it is an opioid medication. It does give euphoria. It does lend to um, a pain control as well. And so because of the fact that it can be abused, there are these abuse deterrent formulations that have been created. I only focus on Suboxone. So the bioavailability of buprenorphine is about 30% sublingually. Um, when it's ejected and it's 100%, people can get a really strong high. And so that's the reason why naloxone is added to the buprenorphine, because even though it's not a bioavailable sublingually, if it's injected, it's, it theoretically could lead to precipitate withdrawal. Um, and so this slide, I think, is really important to understand how buprenorphine falls in line with other opioids that are used for pain control. Um, and this basically shows opioid receptor binding affinity. So this value shows how strong a ligand, which is in this case buprenorphine, binds to a receptor in the case of the mu receptor. And the equilibrium dissociation constant, or KI, represents that binding. So the higher the binding, um, the lower the KI number. And as you can see here, buprenorphine has a very low KI number here. Um, and the medications that we typically use to treat pain are much higher. So if we give these to treat pain um, in a situation where buprenorphine's on, it might not be able to displace the buprenorphine. The methadones is pretty um, low in comparison to buprenorphine as well. Interestingly, hydromorphone is pretty close. So that is something to consider. You know, if you have a patient that is on buprenorphine, this might be one of the better drugs to use in order to be able to treat pain in the face of buprenorphine. Um, so the number of people that are on this medication is increasing throughout the country, but specifically in Maine. Um, for three years in a row, Suboxone has been the most commonly prescribed drug. It's more than our vaccines. It's more than our blood pressure medications, um, asthma medications. Um, and it's big business because there's a lot of money that's being made off of this compound as well. But as more people are on this medication, we really need to figure out how best to manage them when they come into the hospital. 
And so currently there's really no national consensus on how to optimally manage this medication to facilitate analgesia. So the branch of Health and Human Services, um, which is the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, um, they recommend two things, either to continue buprenorphine um, and understand that you're going to have to give lots of opioids at high doses in order to be able to promote analgesia, or they recommend to discontinue it. And that if you discontinue it, the patient will go into withdrawal, you know, because it is an opioid medication. So you have to supplement with opioids on top of the opioids that you're going to give to treat pain. The problem with this is that if you stop these medications, we know um, in the outpatient literature that once they're stopped prematurely, the risk of relapse is very high. Um, there are studies that have shown that up to 82% of people within one month of stopping the medication um, prematurely end up relapsing. Um, so this is not without risk if we actually undertake this. And again, this is what we're doing for a number of years up until recently in the past five years. One thing that's interesting to note is that this organization does not make any recommendations about dose reduction at all. It's either continue or discontinue, but there's nothing about dose reduction. So there's really no high level data to show either way. Um, and so again, before the prevailing practice was to stop the medication. But the data, if you look at the literature, was all based upon case reports and provider opinion. There really were no studies that actually substantiated what we know pharmacodynamically about buprenorphine interfering with pain control. And so because of that, um, we ended up conducting a literature review to identify what is out there to support buprenorphine continuation. We found a series of papers. These are like the major ones. And this still is the core literature that we're all referring to. Nothing really has changed, even though the recommendations have changed. So I think that that's an important thing to mention. And if you even look at this core literature, it's case series, it's retrospective studies with very small sample sizes. Um, but what these studies did show was that buprenorphine um, management is very similar to methadone management when patients come in with acute pain episodes. If you have a patient um, that's on opioid replacement therapy and needs surgery, it's harder to treat their pain than it is someone that's opioid naive, but it's not unsurmountable. And buprenorphine pharmacodynamics aren't influencing or affecting outcomes differently than methadone. Okay, So this at least allowed us to realize that pain control can be managed with buprenorphine continuation. Um, the other place that we ended up looking at was the obstetric literature, um, because the obstetric literature had a number of studies that actually looked at outcomes for patients after cesarean delivery that for mothers that were on either buprenorphine or methadone. The reason why this is an important group to look at is because since labor is inher inherently unpredictable, you can't actually create a situation where you discontinue the medication prior. So we continue it all the time. There's nothing else that can be done. Another other thing is that um, neonatal abstinence syndrome is a significant concern as well. And so that's why we always want to try to continue these medications in mothers because of the implication it would have for their fetus. Um, but what these studies also showed was that there really was no difference in methadone patients versus buprenorphine patients in terms of pain outcomes following cesarean delivery. So synthesizing all that data, uh, we made the determination that that we nationally, we should not be stopping this medication anymore. We should be continuing it. But now the question is, what dose do we continue it at? And so from this, we ended up looking at receptor availability literature, um, focusing mainly on heroin patients um, and or heroin dependent patients, I should say. So this was a study that was um, published a number of years ago by a group in the University of Michigan. And what they did was they identified patients on heroin, they gave them buprenorphine, and then four hours after they received buprenorphine, which is going to be like the peak binding affinity of buprenorphine, they gave them pet label carfentanil, basically. And that was used to identify opioid receptor availability. Any opioid receptor that wasn't bound by buprenorphine would be bound by that car carfentanil. And then what they basically identified was that at higher doses, you have less binding. Um, but at this dose, eight milligrams, up to 30% of opioid receptors are occupied, are, are unoccupied. And so if you're going to give a pain medication, um, though you would be able to have those opioids that you give bind to those receptors. Okay, so then the next thing that they did in the subsequent study was they took that the group that was on 16 milligrams of buprenorphine, and then they did the same study at different time points, and they looked to see what receptor availability prevented withdrawal symptoms. And so at each of these times, the clinical opioid withdrawal scale was conducted, and what they found was that at 28 hours, it was no different than four hours. So 50 to 60% of opioid receptors are required in order to be able to prevent withdrawal from the study. 
And so this basically was our rationale for our guidelines for how to manage patients that are on buprenorphine perioperatively. Um, in Maine, uh, it's interesting to note that most patients aren't on doses higher than 16 milligrams. That's different than Massachusetts. You'll routinely see people on 24 or 32 milligrams, um, but it's lower here. Uh, but in any event, what we recommended was that when pain is minimal, buprenorphine should be continued at full dose. When pain is moderate to severe, the dose should be reduced to eight to 12 milligrams. If it's reduced, it's very important to have discussions with the provider to get the patient back on their full dose as soon as possible. And also recognizing that these patients are gonna need 30%, 40% maybe more opioid supplemental than say an opioid naive patient, just because of the fact that they are opioid tolerant. Um, that's something that sometimes we forget as practitioners. Um, so we definitely make sure that we put that in there, that it's okay if they need more. Um, also the importance of establishing um, a coordinated plan that includes the psychiatrist, that includes the surgeon, that includes the patient as well, so that it will reduce the opportunity for the patient to receive conflicting management recommendations. And then also talking to the patient to let them know what their pain is going to be like. If you know that the pain for that surgery is going to last five days, let them know that so they have something to kind of anticipate and look forward to. That itself is very important for them to be able to uh, make sense of the pain process. Um, and so after those guidelines um, were implemented at Mass General, and then later on at Maine Health, and then a number of institutions have also implemented those guidelines, we ended up doing a retrospective analysis just to identify how patients were doing. Um, and what we identified was that the majority of patients had their buprenorphine continued as compared to health. But when looking at the health group versus continued group, there was less opioid dispensing in the continued group. And there was also less pain in the recovery unit in the continuum group compared to the health group. Um, when looking at whether people stayed on their um, opioid replacement therapy in the form of buprenorphine after surgery, we identified in both groups, the majority of them were getting back on their suboxone at the dose at which they were on prior to surgery, even if when it was held. So that was encouraging as well, because there was a concern that maybe patients would stop taking it if they're taken off of it. Um, so the preliminary study, but still showing that there's early promise that this works. Um, so the next thing that we asked was whether what other people are doing across the country. Um, are people still holding buprenorphine? Are they continuing it? If they're continuing it at what dose? And so basically what this study did was it aimed to identify how providers nationwide manage buprenorphine and also to determine how many institutions actually have a protocol for managing buprenorphine. And so this was just a 10 question survey um, it was distributed between 2021 and 2022. We sent it to 190 institutions, and we also sent it to acute and chronic pain physicians that were identified through the American Society of Regional Anesthesia, which is a very important association in anesthesia that actually creates clinical practice guidelines for how to manage acute pain scenarios. Um, I'll get to the towards the end of our talk about the guidelines that they made for buprenorphine. Um, so anyways, from our respondents, 36% actually reported having a protocol. So the majority did not actually have a protocol, which is concerning. Um, what we did find though that was encouraging was that in situations where mild to moderate pain was um, anticipated, the majority continued their buprenorphine without a dose adjustment. Very few would stop it in the scenario. So that's good to know. However, there was a lot more discrepancy for um, surgeries where severe pain was anticipated. Um, in those types of surgeries, 35% would continue without a dose reduction, 30% would reduce, and then there is a, a group a little over 30% um, that would either stop the medication, 14% would stop the medication, um, and there were some that were just unknown or inconsistent because of the fact that there was no protocol in place. So it shows that there's still a lot of discrepancy in terms of managing. And this was actually distributed to academic centers. So they're gonna be at the forefront of changes and guidelines. So it'll be very interesting to kind of know what's happening in community centers as well. You know, um, if, if they're actually adopting this don't stop mentality. Um, and so the other thing that we found that was quite interesting is that there was a, a significant variation in terms of what dose to give if you are going to reduce the dose. Um, and so very few said 16 milligrams, majority said to reduce between eight to 12. And then there was a group that was unknown, very few said less than eight milligrams. The dosing frequency as well also was quite disparate. 
And so what we concluded basically is that there still remain inconsistent patterns of buprenorphine dosing as well as frequency. And so even though um, there were treatment recommendations that were published in 2021 from ASRA, as I will get to at the end of our talk, they're not being followed by everybody. So we need better dissemination. Um, and so not only do we need consensus guidelines uh, perioperatively, but we need them in the ICU as well. Um, and so this was a study that came out of um, Beth Israel um, back in 2017, where they basically uh, used national um, Vizient data to determine um, how the opioid epidemic, the, our current opioid epidemic has um, impacted our ICUs. And they found that there was a 34% increase in ICU admissions in the decade that they studied. Um, they also showed a 50% increase in cost of care related to this group. So the next thing that they did was they did a, a, conducted a survey. They sent it to 162 hospitals to identify um, whether there were guidelines that existed in those ICUs for how to manage patients with opioid use disorder or how to manage patients that were on medications for opioid use disorder, such as naltrexone, buprenorphine, methadone. And what they found was that the majority did have a guideline in place for how to manage pain for the general ICU population but very few had guidelines on how to manage opioid patients, um, patients with opioid use disorder, and even fewer had guidelines for how to manage buprenorphine and methadone specifically. Um, and the reason why that is you know, concerning is because um, society of critical care medicine that creates pra practice guidelines for how to manage pain, sedation, delirium, they don't have recommendations for how to manage buprenorphine. Um, so that's a gap right there. And um, so from this work, um, our next project was born. So we basically sought to identify the incidence of buprenorphine continuation, um, compare inpatient opioid requirements, and then also to look to see um, the influence of receiving your opioid medications for opioid use, your, your I'm sorry, your medication for opioid use disorder medications and what the influence that is on opioid prescribing. And so uh, this was a collaborative study uh, that um, was conducted here at Maine Medical Center um, with uh, some mentors that I had from at ICU, um, Dave Gagnon, uh, Rich Riker, Dave Cedar, um, and Wendy Craig was very in in instrumental too in terms of uh, doing our analysis for this study. Um, so it was a retrospective review of ICU patients between 2014, 2019, and we included patients that had received buprenorphine with three months prior to their hospital admission. Um, we excluded patients that died, had hospital length of stays of less than 24 hours that used buprenorphine for chronic pain. Um, and for our results, what we identified was that um, the, major the majority of patients um, you know, were smokers, we also identified that you know, over 30% had a chronic pain in diagnosis. They were getting admitted for sepsis, trauma, respiratory failure. Um, and the median dose of, of Suboxone they were coming in at was 16 milligrams. We found that only 30, sorry, only 43.6 of patients um, were receiving buprenorphine while in the ICU. Average dose per day was about eight milligrams. And then post ICU, 58.1% were receiving it. And that um, average dose per day also was lower than what they were coming in on. But that didn't really seem to matter too much because even when they received buprenorphine, we identified that it was protective against receiving, um, or there was an association with less opioid utilization in the form of fentanyl equivalents here, both in the ICU and post-ICU discharge here. Um, and so when we basically looked at um, our adjusted estimated marginal means here, buprenorphine days, 327 versus over 1,800 in the no, in, in, in the patients that did not receive buprenorphine that day. Something similar here in the ICU. Days that buprenorphine was given, a lot less opioid use compared to the days of which it was not given. Um, and this um, linear mixed models aggression, regression analysis adjusted for things such as ventilator use, um, acetaminophen use as well. And so we concluded that discontinuation is associated with significantly increased opioid utilization. Um, and then you can see that as well here when you look at the odds ratio of not just the dose of opioid that you receive, but actually receiving opioid at all. Um, and so when you use the, uh, the days that people received buprenorphine as reference, when people did not receive buprenorphine in the ICU, there was a um, six-fold increase um, in receipt of an opioid 
after ICU discharge, same exact thing. Um, so it's very striking data here. Um, and first of its kind, um, even though it's a relatively small sample size in a single center, it definitely does deserve um, more um, analysis, um, maybe a large scale study to really determine practice general generalizability. But we are seeing that here, the discontinuation um, leads to significantly increased opioid utilization in this population. Um, so the next thing that we looked at were um, the discharge of opioid prescriptions and if they were influenced by whether someone received buprenorphine or methadone at discharge. So we looked at up to 12 months following discharge um, and uh, we divided the group to those that were prescribed either methadone or buprenorphine um, compared to those that were not prescribed. Sorry, this is the, so these are the patients that were prescribed um, buprenorphine or methadone. And then these are the patients that were not prescribed buprenorphine or methadone at discharge three months, six months, or 12 months following discharge from the ICU. And we found that 70% of patients that did not end up getting um, buprenorphine or, meth or methadone um, at discharge ended up receiving an opioid prescription. Okay. Um, and that was significant at every single time point measured. Over time, um, the percentage that actually received an opioid prescription was less for sure. However, if you did not receive um, your buprenorphine or methadone, you're more likely to get a prescription. Um, so this is also just kind of stressing the importance of how patients should be continued on their opioid replacement therapy in order to be able to decrease the risk of going home with a prescription for drugs that they've abused in the past. Um, so all of these, of course, are really great and important. Um, however, it's the next thing we really need to do is con conduct a prospective study in order to identify how buprenorphine should most optimally be managed. And so this is an ongoing study that I'm doing currently. Um, and I'm doing this because of um, funding that I received through the NNACTR, through um, the pilot project award that I was granted um, last year. And um, this study basically is trying to identify whether pain control in terms of pain scores and opioid consumption are different in patients where buprenorphine is continued versus those where the doses were reduced. The other thing that we are looking at is um, whether opioid consumption also is different. And the time points we're looking at are one day, 48 um, hours and 72 hours after surgery. And then the other thing that we're doing as an exploratory analysis is looking at OUD symptom severity and depressive symptoms in each group to see if there's any difference there. Um, and then also looking at their opioid prescriptions as well as um, their whether they're back on their buprenorphine at their full dose following surgery. Um, so for this study, uh, we looked at uh, patients that had procedures done at Maine Medical Center or our outpatient surgical campus that were considered moderate uh, to severe in terms of pain. Um, and we only looked at patients that um, didn't have um, end-stage illness um, or comorbidity. Uh, so we excluded end-stage organ disease, dementia, um, and also uh, patients that were on buprenorphine for chronic pain. And so this is our model here. Um, we have a um, report that basically shows us patients that are eligible for the study um, that are on buprenorphine. We call them, um, consent them for the study. Uh, three days before surgery, we randomize them to either continue their buprenorphine at eight milligrams, which is our current main health guideline, or to continue at a full dose without a dose reduction, which was the ASR guidelines, but I'll get that into that in, in, a, in a moment. And so day of surgery, we asked them a series of baseline instruments to measures in order to be able to get baseline measures for opioid craving, um, misuse, psychiatric comorbidity. Um, and then we obtained their pain scores and opioid consumption at these time points. One month following, we contact them again, have them go through those instruments again to see if there's any difference between the baseline measurements. We contact their buprenorphine provider to see whether they've been seen within that 30 day period whether there are any known relapse events that they're aware of, and then also if they're back on the buprenorphine, and then we also can look at their um, prescription uh, monitoring program information as well to identify if they're on any pain medications or if they're on, still on their buprenorphine. And so this is our subject's recruitment so far. Um, since we actually did this um, preliminary analysis, we have um, three more patients that were randomized. So. We are over 10% of what our goal is, but we're still very shy of where we wanna be. Um, a lot did not meet inclusion criteria. 
There were 45 uh, that just chose not to be enrolled for a number of different reasons. We're unable to contact them um, or, you know, surgeon didn't want them to participate. Lots of different reasons here. Um, and so this is the results from the small sample size currently. Um, so most are on 16 milligrams here of buprenorphine. Um, three of them were randomized to, to reduce the dose. Three were randomized to continue the dose. They were all different types of surgical procedures. However, they're all considered to be either moderate or severe here. Um, and something interesting, what we identified was that when buprenorphine is continued in full, as opposed to reduced, it looks like there's less opioid utilization. But again, this is so, such a small sample. You can't really interpret. This is where things were going. Pictorially, you can see this here as well. So there's a trend toward lower pain scores. Um, in these blue lines here. This represents the group where buprenorphine is continued in full um, compared to where it's reduced. Uh, in terms of post-operative day two, where buprenorphine is reduced, there might be increased opioid use. Again, it's very early. Um, and uh, for the most part, there's low opioid craving in both groups so far. Um, so they think this will be a very interesting study um, once we're able to recruit and we have to identify ways to um, increase uh, our, our current, um, the, the, the amount of patients that we're recruiting currently. Um, it's very challenging to get information from these patients. Things that are encouraging is that um, all the patients that we have identified here did stay on their full dose buprenorphine one month following surgery, and none of the patients have any evidence of opioid relapse too. Um, so all that's encouraging. And our next steps are for those 45 patients that met criteria, however, did not participate in the study. We're actually going to do a retrospective, anal retrospective analysis of their um, of their postoperative outcomes, and we have recently submitted an IRB for that. So hopefully, within like the next two months or so, we'll be able to get that going. Um, but we really need to explore how maybe we can transition to a multi-center trial for this study, for instance. Um, the reason why I think that this is really important um, is because, um, as I alluded to. The ASRA, the society that creates these clinical practice guidelines for us for pain management, they issued these guidelines in 2021, where they basically recommended that um, all patients should continue on buprenorphine um, perioperatively or in scenarios where acute pain is anticipated, regardless of the dose that they're on. Um, they And they also say that they should consider increasing the dose potentially um, in order to be able to manage pain. Um, interestingly, in the paper, there are no, there's no core literature to actually cite this as um, a, uh, a, a treatment alternative. I'm not saying that it's not something that should be done, but it's something that really has not been studied vigorously at this point. Um, but in any event, their guidelines in 2021 were to continue without dose adjustment, regardless of whether the pain was mild or severe. Um, so then fast forward to a couple of months ago, they actually issued a new statement and new recommendations where they actually mention, um, they make a, a distinction in terms of whether to continue in full based upon whether mild or moderate to severe pain is anticipated. So in situations with mild pain, similar to the 2021 guideline, continue the dose. Um, for moderate to severe pain, however, they're saying that the dose should be reduced in situations where it's less than 16 milligrams. Um, the thing that's interesting is that they don't really make reference to the 2021 guidelines. They don't state why they made this change. And so um, even the society doesn't really know exactly what dosing to give. So I think that because of that, it's important for us to have a high level evidence to support what to do next. So management of these patients is challenging regardless of strategy. They have lower pain tolerance, comorbid pain conditions. There's also increased use of relapse. They require, they're going to require higher doses for pain than opioid naive patients as well. And um, one thing that I didn't mention, but of course it's very important that multimodal analgesia needs to be maximized. So we're not just relying on opioids to treat pain. Um, but it's also important to make sure that all members of the treatment team are available to manage these patients as well um, throughout the perioperative course. Um, pain expectations need to be discussed as well. Um, and then um, patients should also communicate with their prescribers within that five to seven days after surgery. I feel like all this stuff is just as important as how we decide to manage the medications they are on to treat their opioid use disorder. So that's, that's it. So I'd like to open this for questions now.
All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Quay, for that really, really interesting presentation. Um, so if anyone has questions, feel free to raise your hand or put them in the chat and I can read them out loud. But just to get us started, Dr. Quay, I was wondering if um, when you talked about the um, like pregnant women, vaginal versus cesarean deliveries and how that is one model where you really can't change, like, because it's an unexpected event, you're not changing the, the dose. Could, uh, like a unexpected fracture in a patient also be used as one um, scenario where a patient's not, you know, the dose isn't changed because it's sort of an unexpected event where there would be pain um, occurring. And could that sort of be used as another way to look at um, a, a pain incidence where there's no change in buprenorphine levels? Yeah, no, definitely, for sure. And um, unfortunately, there were no studies that were done for that um, prior to us making our determination for continuation. Um, because you're right, those are instances as well that are unpredictable, and you can't make recommendations for how to manage the medication prior to the insult. Um, mm -hmm. But that's where a lot of the case reports came from in terms of patients ah, okay. that were very challenging in terms of pain management. There are a few that said that patient had to go to the ICU for like a Presidex infusion or for like a remifentanil infusion afterwards. And that's pretty much one of the main reasons why um, for a long time we would stop the medication when we were able to because of these case reports that were in the literature. But there was mm -hmm. never a study that actually kind of looked at the outcomes for those patients versus others. Um, and, and that's something that could have been done for sure, but it just wasn't. Great, thank you. Okay, it looks like we have one question so far from MMC Addiction Fellowship. Would it be reasonable to expand the study population to patients on buprenorphine naloxone who are admitted for non-operative reasons? Seems like the management of those patients are not consistent either. Um, yeah, no, I definitely, I definitely agree. Um, I think that it would be good to identify uh, that cohort as well. Um, I think that one thing that you have to do is to figure out what, whether it's an acute condition or acute painful condition that is contributing to their inpatient stay um, or, you know, figuring out whether that influences continuation versus discontinuation for sure. But I definitely agree that is something that should be evaluated. Um, in terms of the guidelines that we created through Maine, Maine Health that um, recommend continuation, we did extend that for um, inpatient units as well as IC units as well. Um, the level of adherence to those guidelines, though, I'm not sure. We never really looked at it. Like if someone comes in with pancreatitis and is on Suboxone, is it being continued? I'm not sure. So that would be something definitely very interesting to, to investigate. Thank you. Um, I was also wondering if you had... Um, noticed any differences like sex differences or other um, differences in like patient demographics that would like that influence the way that patients were being treated um, whether or not the buprenorphine was limited uh, reduced during us before surgery yeah um so specifically asking that question no we we did not look at that um However, in our um, the mixed model analysis for ICU, we did look at all variables that were independently associated um, with, with um, reduction um, or discontinuation. Um, and that did not come up as a reason, but it could just be that we didn't have the right effect size. Um, but that definitely would be, I think, an important question to ask with like a larger sample um, in terms of like what uh, if, if there if there are any specific like clinical characteristics that lend to like one treatment strategy over another. I know mm -hmm. that there is some literature about that for sure. Um, but that's a lot of it's like more so for like actually getting the medication because currently right now, like less than, I think it's like 20% or something like that, a patient that can be on the medication are actually receiving it. And there definitely really? varies in terms of who's getting it versus not. Um, so that is a, like, that's a big focus for sure. Um, but in terms of management, I don't, I can't recall any studies that have looked at that specifically. Interesting. Okay. Any other questions? 
I'll jump in with a really naive one, uh, since this isn't my field at all. <clears throat> By the way, hi, uh, Dr. Quinn, <laughs> nice to see you again. So yeah. as you know from talking to me before, I, I can ask me questions. So I'm really curious about how that process goes. Someone shows up, they need to be operated on, there's going to be pain. They're not on any treatment. So I guess it's a two-part question. How do you figure out how to treat them, given that from what I understand, their pain receptors are all taken up by the opioids. And then I guess secondarily, it strikes me that it's a really interesting opportunity for someone with so few treatment centers in Maine to say, hey, buprenorphine is a, a, is a painkiller, it, it, you know, it, as well as something that can help you with your addiction. So naive questions, but how, how, how would you respond to those two? Yeah, no, definitely. Well, yeah, for the second one, I think that that was kind of one of our like big conclusions in terms of why it should be continued is because when you stop it, you end up creating a pain deficit. And so you end up having, and it's such a potent medication that you end up having to give so much more of the medication that were used to treat pain or to just offset that alone. So we think that that's probably part of what's going on as well um, and why patients do so much better when you keep that pain medication on. So for sure, and it, and, and of course, it's something that, sounds like so self-explanatory, you know, but I think that for a long time, we were really focusing on like the pharmacodynamics of the medication. Um, and I'm sorry, in terms of the first part of your question, I, I don't know if I fully understood it. Sorry. Yeah, I guess. So, well, let me, let me go to the second one first. So it just strikes me as if the surgeon's having this conversation with the patient, that patient hasn't had any treatment for opioid abuse. It strikes me as a, you know, it's not the time you do the counseling necessarily, but it strikes me as an awesome opportunity to talk about getting someone off of the opioids while they're also getting pain. Oh, I see medicine. what you're saying. Yeah, and no, I see what you're saying. Like in terms of patients that aren't on methadone or suboxone, like right, exactly, yeah. as an opportunity. Um, yeah, definitely. I, it's interesting. That's actually one of the things that ASRA, um, the guidelines for 2021 did talk about. Um, and there's definitely a lot of work like in the ED that is looking at that as well, like using opportunity for someone coming into the ED, either because of an issue related to their opioid use disorder, um, or just like um, another reason, introducing micro-induction buprenorphine treatment for them. Um, it's definitely something that is being done. Um, a, and the recommendation for sure is a good one. I don't think that there are any studies that have come up perioperatively in terms of people actually doing that. Um, but it might be an interesting thing to do with like maybe IV buprenorphine or something like that. Like for a patient that's like coming in um, with a history of opioid use disorder, maybe managing their pain with a medication like that as opposed to giving them a full agonist. I think that that would be great. But mm -hmm. ASRA does make recommendations for that. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. And then, yeah, and the other one it kind of goes back to my original conversation with you from, you know, March, whenever it was like, how do you know when someone, if someone's pain receptors are all taken up and yet they're in pain, because as we're seeing in your slide right here, there's lowered pain tolerance. How do you know how to treat somebody when they're going to be in pain in, in surgery in particular and keep them alive? Because it strikes me that, again, not knowing anything about your, your world, it strikes me that that's why people die, because they get too much of what yeah. would stop pain. So you must have to be monitoring that very closely. Yeah. Well, I guess one of the things is that for opioid tolerant patients, um, they end up getting pretty resistant to the side effects of it as well, too. So they can tolerate pretty high doses in general um, uh, as compared to a, an opioid naive patient. Um, but I think that's one of the reasons why the multimodal analgesia is like, really important as well. Like, we can't just rely on opioids. And so what we really try to do is maximize other kind of pain medications as much as possible. Like if someone can get a regional nerve block that just completely this, like, takes away pain completely, um, we try to do that. Um, or we'll they do ketamine infusions a lot, um, you know, Tylenol, Tordol, all these things, sometimes clonidine. Um, and and just really maximize everything that we can. But it can be very difficult, for sure, to manage pain in those patients. Thank you. Thanks for uh, enlightening me. I, I appreciate that. Yeah, my pleasure. Um, there's just a comment in the chat that MMC Psych CNL is happy to see patients and help navigate starting MOUD. That's Are there great. any other questions or comments? 
One final question that um that I had was, do you ever see patients for surgeries that were previously um, on medications for opioid use disorder, but had like weaned, like successfully sort of weaned off of them? And do they have differences in post-operative pain compared to patients who are currently being treated? Um, yeah, no, definitely for sure. I haven't really studied them, but I've encountered patients that um, have had issues, have weaned off of um, from from either suboxone or methadone, and are very reluctant to have any other opioid medication introduced into their care. And I think part of one of the reasons why that they're very highly motivated is a lot easier to actually manage their patient with like non opioid medications. Mm -hmm. We definitely try to respect that as much as possible. Um, and overall, they do pretty well. Um, I don't think that I've well, that's the thing. I don't really follow patients more than just seeing them in PACU. So I don't really know mm -hmm. what like the extended outcomes are, but I haven't really had a patient to my recollection where I have been unable to manage their pain effectively um, to prevent, you know, PACU discharge by just giving non-opioid strategies for their pain management. Great. All right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Quay, for that wonderful presentation and for everyone for your participation. Um, and thank you for those of you who have stuck with us throughout this NNECTR seminar series. It's been great fun. Thank, thank you. you.